All right, welcome back. After my little escape there, uh, that was a that was an intensive start. <laughs> I get uh, pretty uh, uh, busy just before doing something like a workshop, and uh, but we're back and uh, looking forward to a conversation with uh, based on something David uh, has. Uh, David, a former student, has um, brought to me. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to say in a preliminary way. Um, I do. I did receive uh, some donations, at least one donation, um, since uh, last we talked, and uh, I think uh, I didn't see it on the list, so I'm not knowing how to go digging that up. and may leave it up to, to uh, Mr. Producer to put that in this time, or I'll talk about it next time. All right. And all right, so um, let's move to the question. This was a massive comment that David made. And it was based on the conversation uh, that I had about, <clears throat> in, in significant ways, I was talking about the need for a search and, and the heuristic method, the, uh, the, the, the uh, mentality of making a statement and then correcting the statement, you know, to, to, to write is to rewrite, that sort of model. You, you may be just simply re rehearsing what I'm saying, but you may also just be mishearing what I'm saying. And I thought it was a chance to really focus in on the idea of anchors because it sounded like you had the idea that we just wander around all the time and don't ever make decisions. And of course, that's not true. Although I do, I'm a, very much a model, I, I say I prefer to model the decision making along the lines of uh, my friend Jan uh, from back in my school days with Gamble, who's talked about his mom saying, uh, in a sense, saying, no, don't make decisions, just keep on looking and looking until there's no decision to be made. Well, in any case, when you're dealing with a um, uh, an impressionist painting, there's always decisions to be made. The first time you look through a viewfinder, you have to decide exactly where, you know, where in front of you you're looking, uh, how, you know, the, the, the proportions of the rectangle, how far or close you are to that part you find to be the center of interest, and, if, and finding a center of interest and putting it left, right, high, low. There's a whole series of decisions you have to make before you even start an impressionist painting. And, and they're based on knowledge but they're also based on experience, and uh, and experience, by inevitably, is rather a trial and error thing, isn't it? Uh, in other words, you can't, you may do it, be doing your very, very best to do a thing right, but in fact, you're going to be doing it better at time in the future, because every, every everything, every, every every attempt you make, is going to be information that grist to the mill, you know, information for the next uh, the next attempt. So. In any, you know, your entire life rather is a trial and error thing. So it's one of those things where it's uh, significant that we don't uh, that we don't misunderstand each other. So here's here he says at some point you must mix and apply the correct color. Now I am jumping away from a bunch of the stuff he started with, just to make it this short, <laughs> David. So um, at some point you must mix and apply the correct color. Uh, the idea of mixing and applying, let's start with that. I don't mix and apply the correct color. That's, I mean, as initial attempt I do, but I apply the color that I believe is the correct color, and then it's open for correction, right? So that's what I would call an attempt. It, you know, and, the, and, and, and the Boston School, Tar Tarbell's comment was about how this is a search. Everything's a search. The relationships inevitably are adjustable, right? So again, search, you know, uh, this to this and that to that, and all of a sudden you have more information and certain things have to be adjusted, right? So I don't uh, mix and apply the correct color, and I don't recommend students do it either. I recommend students use the, whatever color they have and adjust that color, as I've said before, because otherwise your paint's gonna get thicker and thicker and get out of control. All right, just so, you, so, so you've heard that part. Some people learn how to type and others spend their entire lives using the hunt and peck method. It's, now, I'm, no, I'm not a guy who recommends that you don't learn things <laughs> and just sort of guess all the time the rest of your life. There are, you're looking for best practices all the time. And the first place you start is with somebody else's best practices. So I'm not talking about the larger picture, but I am one of those guys who's actually willing to adjust, willing to try a new thing and maybe adjust my entire way of working which is very method-based, so to speak, as it must be. Uh, so um, that, that wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's a very fair comparison, but we'll go, we'll go from there. These first attempts accomplish color, drawing, composition. Uh, oh, he's talking about the masters. I'm sorry. It's, not, in fact, it's, it's fascinating to look at the starts of the masters. And of course, we're, if we're talking about us, the Impressionists, we're talking about starts of the Boston School guys. If he means that, we can talk about the same thing. If you're talking about guys who who do drawings first and then lay in, cover the drawings with paint and that sort of stuff. That's a whole different model. 
I am never talking about that as the primary when I'm talking about what I know. Um, so these, so, the, so this, looking at the starts of the masters, these first attempts accomplish color drawing compositions succeed in very direct expressions. Yeah, that's right. They nail the big impression by focusing on the key features with an economy of motion. That's really a good point, David. But he says, you can see a decisive and deliberate strategy in their work. Uh, decide not deciding. Um, you know, the, ho hopefully you don't misunderstand me when you say that. Uh, you are looking for information, you're looking for data. You're, you have to make a statement. Every statement you make could possibly be the one, but every statement you make has to be perforce a question. You make an attempt and you believe it's something, but you don't just decide it's something. You, you wait until it decides. So you see this set of relationships. And for example, the first two things you put down, uh, you, the first one's just a wild guess. The second one, it, and it may be corrected as a sight sizer would do it. And the second one may be even the same, but the one after that, when, the, when these two notes have to be right to each other, now you're in a different place. Now you have to say, let's make the adjustments until they're right to each other, because that's the entire game. They're right to each other game. And it always requires an adjustment. So in that sense, you decide by not deciding. Uh, float it all out there. He's quoting me. Float it all out there, and at some point it'll decide for you. Uh, I'm hoping you can all hear what I'm saying when I say that. You can see why I'm going, talk, going to talk about anchors, because there's no such thing as just simply floating stuff indefinitely. And it just falls, things don't just fall into place. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you've chosen a composition, and the places things have to land have very, very much to do with, with the scene you're looking at. The location of the center is a very specific thing, or the dominant portion of the picture. The exits in the picture are very specific locations. That are, that there's, not a, there's not a question of uh, messing around. Uh, although I would still say you, you will put that location, save an exit, you'll put it there and you'll look to see if you got it and you'll adjust it if you didn't. So I always consider the first mark I make a question mark, even though I'm making a very strong attempt to make it exactly what I think it is. So everyone does that. You're, you're going right for it, and then the adjustment's got to be a crucial piece of this. Uh, float it out there, and at some point it won't decide for you. No, it won't, but something like that's going on. Stumble along, guessing until you find the answer. <laughs> you know I don't mean that, David. <laughs> what does this mean to the serious painters? The painters who drew multiple casts as part of their training, the painters who meticulously set up still life arrangements and work out color harmonies. What of critiques? The easiest answer to any critique is my strategy is trial and error. <laughs> Nothing on my canvas is based on a decision. And everything. So um, you can follow where David's coming from. Um, so this is a, basically, an, 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 it sounds like an argument against my discussion about how to do a search. And uh, if you want to say it's a hunt and peck, if you want to say it's a hunt and peck method, in some sense it is, but it isn't an ignorant one. It's not one that doesn't have, um, uh, it just isn't a formula in itself. I'm not going to make the color scheme one I made before. It's the one that's new today. So I have to find that. Do you see what I mean? Um, so why, what am I getting at? So here's his point. You must comprehend why. Why specific elements of your subject, value, color, shape, etc., are essential to the overall impression. Identify them and paint them correctly. So that we completely agree on. And now I'm going to show you how I go about doing it and why it's not just a question of wandering around and hunting and pecking. Okay? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to show you some of my work. But these are the points I'm going to make with you and discuss. And we'll do it with my work, either back and forth or I'll bring these points up again. But first of all, um, if I, there, there are various things. If you're just doing a cast, I've always told the student to make an attempt to place the cast so it's balanced, so it's an equilibrium in the rectangle, so it doesn't feel like it's too far left or too far right. So that's a phenomenon. You've got to figure out a way to do that. And I teach students to, center, to learn to, uh, by, by if, depending on how simple the setup is, by, by dropping a line, uh, a, a plumb line. Just move it back and forth through this space you're thinking about, or in the case of the cast, through that area, through the cast, just through the cast itself. Hang a string and just move it back and forth, back and forth, watching for the left side and the right side to start to balance. And then when you notice where that is, you'll notice some point that it lines up on, uh, a little part in the hair or something like that, or one of the feet, and that'll be, it turns out that spot, it, will get, will, it lines up very, very near center, and you put that, and you say, I'm going to put that there and keep it there. So this is an anchoring. That's one kind of an anchoring just when you're doing that with a single object, right? That's anchoring. And that's, there's going to be this whole series of things about anchoring. And I'm doing this in rather a random way. I just bounced these off my own head. And I, afterwards, I thought of another one. I, now I've forgotten. I didn't write it down. 
But um, if you're talking about, uh, if you jump down there to setting the darkest dark and lightest light, everybody tells you to do that, right? You have to make a decision right from the beginning. You have to say, let this be my darkest dark and lightest light. Now, that sort of thing for a while is still adjustable, right? But, but it's not adjustable. It's only adjustable in its actual value. It still will be the darkest dark. And it's not, a dis it's, it's not a decision. It's an observation. Do you see what I mean? So you will set a darkest dark. You'll set a lightest light. And you'll be thinking about that as you're and, 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 and trying to arrange those things so that they will do that. Let's just pretend it's just black and white, the, the, ex the exercise you're doing. And, um, and you'll say, let's live between these places, right? But then you have to, uh, uh, for example, in the third point on this list, we talk about fixing, well, now I'm gonna, I call it the extensions, it's somebody else's word, but the top and bottom, if you're doing a cast, you say top and bottom. Anytime you're doing a picture this long, I suggest that you locate, and in a, as, with the mindset of actually fixing those things in place permanently, the longest dimension, and then fix a place the other way. So if you're, if you're doing a, a still life, wide still life, uh, you will you will you'll you'll fix the lengths because you'll you decide you're looking through your viewfinder and you say I don't want these to be start, starting to touch them on the frame, so I want to place them at such and such a location. These these whatever it is outermost points that you don't want to touch the frame. And you set them where you think it's safe. And then you say, now what must the heights be? And you have to make and you have to make a determination about how high it will be. So every one of these things is anchoring that you must do. These are decisions you must make. You don't just float stuff around. Uh, if you look through a viewfinder, right? So this is a deliberate and, um, and um, uh, disciplined approach to drawing what you see through, through a frame, right? Through the viewfinder. Sight finder, some people call it. So you're fixing the lengths. Then you're trying to fix, if you, if, you, if you fix the lengths, you are trying to fix something vertically, if you're on a still life like that, that you can say, all right, if I, if I get this, when I look through the viewfinder, I got these where I want them, and about a third of the way down, there's this. And that's something that will help you to anchor this. Now, I'm not the guy, you'll then have to hunt for the height of this to go with that. That's a search. I'm not a guy who believes you should anchor to, 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 to height, to length, and to width. I believe you have to anchor, you, you anchor your width to the length. You see, I mean, that's different to do. You can't do two, you'll be of mixed minds. Unless you're just lucky and guess right, or unless you do a measurement instead of losing your eyes, right? So in that process, searching for that height that's going to go with this width, that's going to be in the, in the, in the trial and error model. You're going to hunt for it by, let's put it here and see if that looks right, okay? And that's all that model really means. But you want to be able to make the decision with your eyes. Which is why in our way of working, you actually have to draw in these first marks, you have to articulate something of the look of nature so that you're not just guessing. Uh, frequently, you'll find that the, that the proportions you're making aren't right the, uh, by, by just some marks you made. And then as soon as you articulate the shapes better, all of a sudden you realize that, <laughs> that those marks didn't mean a whole lot. The shape is now, because of the shape in there, all of a sudden this overall feeling of the width of the length is going fe to feel different. You're going you're gonna to be... Um, and able to really, really bring it, nail it. How many other things do you know about already? Um, let's go back to this one way down here, the viewing position. That's fixed, all right? You look through a viewfinder, you're standing in this spot. Don't be moving from that spot. These are fixed, these are anchors, okay? Stay in this spot. Not only just stay in this spot, but looking at, at, at that area over there, whatever it is, say it's a, a piece of a tree that you can look at, and if you lean a little bit, another tree just peeks out. But if you lean back, that tree disappears again, the one that was behind it, shall we say. Uh, that's your anchor this way, right? We talked about that, and you can look at that one of the just the very recent videos. So, so that's an anchor. That's placing yourself on the grass. Anchors, anchors everywhere. You're not speculating. You're not uh, hunting and pecking about where you're standing. And you're not vacillating. So these are very decisive things that you're doing as an impressionist. There's no vagueness involved in them. Uh, when you're painting, your painting needs to be plum. Uh, the one, the one just above that one in the points here. Your painting needs to be plum. Now that's an absolute anchor, right? Don't be painting with your painting crooked, and then try to transpose things over there. So your painting should always be plum. When it's sitting in front of you, you should you should be working with the edge near at least the edge nearest the uh, viewer, nearest the scene, I should say. You should say here's, here's your painting. Here's the scene. This edge of your painting, it minimally needs to be absolutely vertical. Of course, you're always fixing your canvas. Every time you do a canvas, you're making sure it's facing you directly. So you understand 
these are all in the class of decisions based on long on training even and then they're absolute disciplines for the moment right but they are anchoring you're anchoring to a learned thing right um, even when I paint you know the formula you have is your is your series of experiences you find this works better than that so you'll anchor to those until you find better ones but notice that that search for better ones is always with you I hope it's always with you and uh, so you don't become an absolutist you actually become a limited absolutist okay so this is your method so far but you may find for example that you were working from points and maybe it's better in this this particular setup to work from the mass and come to the points rather I think that's the difference between me and and, and, and Meldrum as best I can see it uh, just for whatever that's worth now um, so let's go to the top again establishing the exits in a painting well, if you're looking through a viewfinder, these are absolutely things you're going to be looking for. You're going to try to place things so you can organize your... This is compositional stuff. You know, where do these exits land when you're looking at just such a scene from just such a location and just, you know, the viewfinder being just like this with these proportions and so on. So obviously you're going to have to uh, establish the exits and... Um, oh, actually, I'll just go ahead and show you a picture. Um, it's here. I got these three pictures. Just These are all mine, so... But you can see what as establishing exits, things like this, how far is this over? They help you to, with everything else you're doing to get the composition you want. If you're looking through the viewfinder and you like this composition, just this being whatever that is, you know, two sevenths or whatever the heck it is. And this, this, this thing over here landing where it lands in relation to the total length. You follow every one of these things. This one over here landing here. Every one of these things is a must, you must, it's a must find thing. So every little thing you're doing is a search for fixedness but it's a search for fixedness it's, it, it's in other words you say i see where this lands i'm going to put it there i'm going to put it there until i get it right right and trial and error is what i'm talking about you, you put it there and look at it and see with your eyes if it looks right based on what you had seen and preconceived you know preconceived as ang would put it so that would be true of every proportion that exits a picture every single one this one this one any any of those things is that that's not a <laughs> that's not even part of the painting, etc. Um, so yeah, so here when I was talking, I was saying anchoring. This is this is top. Say a, you might anchor to a length like this. This is kind of fuzzy, so you might pick that and maybe get some of this involved, so you have a good. And you're going to say the whole bottom of this picture is, or even including some of this, you might say this is going to be the bottom of this picture, and this is going to be the height. And you put those places, and you say I'm never moving those certain amount of the shape may adjust a little bit and all that sort of thing but you're saying I'm fixing these places in space so this is the search for those places you put up your marks and you move them until they're in the right place do you follow me so I'm not this guy who does a careful pre-measuring and so I don't so I'm careful not to put them in the wrong place I put them up there about with my eyeballs so I so that they feel like they're in the right place and then I go back and as I say debrief and I look to see if I did what I meant to do right it, the thing I conceived so um, as I was saying before, that would be the top and the bottom, and then I'd be then I would be sitting myself up to locate some very strong left-right location, right? Now that in itself has its own proportions to this whole thing. This in itself has its own, and when they're both in there together, they all have to be right. So this proportion has to be right to this one, and so on. But you are trying to set this thing as a center of interest, just where you want it. And you're trying to get the exits. It's all and, right? <laughs> and you're trying to get all the exits set up all at the same time. And you're going to see that's going to take a little mobility. It's going to take you, if you're using your eyes to do this, it's going to take you some setting up an effect like this here, adjusting the effect till it's very effective, like if you didn't make this strong enough to get that light effect. Because I'm getting, because I'm anchoring to also two effects. So, and uh, let's go back to the list. So you see me talking about it, um, uh, edge sharpness but the order of the effects so the anchoring to effects that's huge this is huge stuff this is my leading effect in this painting right now everything that's leading in a painting what's the most chromatic spot you're anchoring to those sorts of things right if you want to know what the leading chroma is in a picture in the ensemble of the colors you put out there you want to know which is the most chromatic and you're going to put it out there in this field and it's going to be that and nobody's going to get past it okay it's going to be fixed there in the same exact way the top high contrast what what does what does uh, Meldrum call it the uh, uh, 
oh, disturbance, the light disturbance. <laughs> this is the great light disturbance in this painting, and this edge here is the one that really brings it into a location. The, particularly some, some spot like this to this will we'll locate it this way as well as it, looking at it this way. Those sorts of things. But this is an anchor by effect slash edge. And so in the edge world, every time you're, all the whole time you're out there, you're not trying to get this right. You're trying to get this right to this. If this is the edge, the power edge, that's the leading edge in the painting by, 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 by sharpness, then everybody, that has to be, that's a decision but it's a decision by drawing it till you see it, till it begins to be what you see in front of you, and then relating all the other guys to it, okay? But can you all follow the anchoring has these multiplicity, it has these levels and levels and levels and levels. Let's have a look again, what else we talk about? Well, we talked about setting the darkest dark and lightest light. Okay, now setting the chroma, let's talk about that. Uh, and then that goes into four other ideas, but uh, this, is, this is a, um, this, this picture has a certain amount of chroma overall. Uh, overall, probably a little more chromatic than this one. Probably overall, a little more chromatic than this one. Maybe you can see that. This is a more neutral painting. So, um, or you could say this is a darker painting. Uh, and well, these two are maybe fairly similar in terms of their value, but the general tonality of this picture, that's one of the things you're trying to set. You're trying to set the relative chromaticity, what I call the relative chroma, though, of the entire painting. This painting is a blue painting. This is rather a green painting, and this is a something else. Something, <laughs> I wouldn't call it exactly a purple painting, but you, you can see that these are different colors as a set, as a whole, as a totality. And that's got to be on your mind, and you are trying to set that. But these are, this is, progress is being made toward these things that you're trying to fix. So all your explorations are for a point, right? If you don't have a concept of the thing fixed in your mind and eye in these capacities, in other words, it, the relative uh, 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 color scheme of the picture, if you don't have it in your mind, everything is just sight size. But you're, where we, when will you know when you've arrived if you don't have a concept of it preset in your mind? So, um, uh, but in each of these cases, you know where you're headed, and that's going to be, you're looking for a fixed point in space. You're headed toward making this total ensemble do X that you've already preconceived by looking. Okay. Uh, let's see what else I, I can talk about. Maybe I'll just review these paintings with the same exact sorts of things in mind. Remember, everything you do are decisions all over the place here. Your first decision that you're going to make is, is something like an extension, top and bottom. Or it's going to be your dark is dark and your light is light. And uh, that's fairly, that's fairly uh, routine, right? I wasn't able to do a true bottom here, so I got this about where I thought it would, where these two guys were doing the right thing. But the thing that made the bottom was this shadow here cutting sharply against this V, so it's a soft thing. So that was, became the placement I decided to have in this setting. I wanted this to be just that half inch or whatever it was above the, above the bottom of the frame. Um, and I decided, I decided where I wanted this. So here's the height and height again that I fixed. So that's a decision. By the way, there are these decisions you get to make out of the blue, right? They're compositional decisions. How high you're going to place something in a picture, that's say how high or how low, how big it's going to be in the picture, and how far left and right. That's entirely some absolute, these are out of the blue decisions, right? So you've made those decisions, but you still, if you're going to be like me, you're going to still be exploring it. You're still going to go out there and say, I believe it should be right here, get that effect there, and then don't believe in it because you pre-measured it. Just look at it and see if it's doing, if it's placing itself the way you intended. Do you see what I mean? In that way, we're talking about trial and error, right? But I want to see everything in front of me happening. I want to see, well, I like that when Meldrum says these pictures should look transferable, right? They should just be, they should, you should be able, this, they, they should look like you'd easily just switch them and you wouldn't be able to see a difference. One of them will just be more finished, but the, everything about the, what's already there should just be transferable. And that's a really good model, but it shows you what your agenda is. So, so what my point is in saying all these things is anchoring is crucial. <laughs> anchoring is, is, it's not a decision in a pre-cut way, well, except for, but it's, but it's a determination as a, for, in a viewfinder. It, there's a determination, a determination, determination about placement, and there's a determination about, well, the relative chroma, for example, if the most highly chromatic spot on this painting is here or here, whatever you choose, 
that's going to never be surpassed by anybody else in the competition. These are decisions and you have to put that up there and make the statement to yourself and say, let it be this. And you have those options and these are absolute decisions, right? Now, that doesn't mean you put them up there and then say, oh, oh I'm stuck with that. You put it up there and you say, whoops, I think that's not going to work out. That's an inky black and that dark in my picture is rich. So I'm going to have to make an adjustment and make, the, make sure it's got the color I need. Uh, but at that point, you say, now, when I have this dark, as dark as I really needed to get the effect, and it's got the right amount of color, now I have that. But that, it's not an absolute decision because sight size is an absolute. You can't take nature and transplant it over here. Otherwise, David would be right about that. But you can't. You can say you're doing that, but the only absolute truth is the truth of the relationships. Um, and that's just routinely the case throughout all of the uh, Impressionist um, stru uh, structure methodology. So um, let's see. Um, so you see how in, in all cases here, there, this probably the most chromatic note in this one was here, and I made a decision about that and made it do what I thought it needed to do. Um, the sharpest edge, strongest effect, the most powerful effects are right in here. Well, there's a highlight right in the middle of this, so I had all those talking to each other fairly early on to get the big package of the... But, um, but none of these otherwise are pre-designed decisions except for, you know, like some location I may have decided where this was as the lead left and right thing, and then I made these other guys coordinate with it. I could easily have actually placed this because it was such an easy thing if I decided that the half was right between these two points or some such thing, then I might place that early and use that and never move that. But that's a thing where you don't, don't mess around with your viewfinder. If you look at your viewfinder and accidentally looking at it wrong <laughs> for one minute, you might start changing all over the place. So your viewfinder really is a binding. You know, you really want to be bound to what you saw through the viewfinder. Um, so let's see. I'm going to go back to David's in a second, but let's see what else I might be missing. So do you see how what we're doing? We're anchoring, anchoring, anchoring. Oh, so the last thing I did talk about was the general value, the general chroma, the general hue. And I didn't talk about the gesture. So paintings as an overall thing, you could argue that the gesture of this painting is a great movement across here, right? Uh, you may not want to, but the, but there, and then there are sub-gestures, and each one of these things has to be good, right? This is a different one. This thing itself, the figure has its own gesture, but, but there's an overall uh, a gesture, what I call main line to a picture, every time. And if you're observing through a viewfinder with the frames vertical and all that sort of stuff, you should have a sense of it and you need to have a sense of it so you know where you're going, so that all your trial and error knows exactly what it's trying to get to, right? So maybe the answer to what David is saying, if he means it the way it sounds in part, is that I don't make a priori decisions about this except through the viewfinder and getting a concept of the whole the placement of the whole vertically and left and right and how big, right, in relation to the frame. Uh, having made those, having a strong concept of those things fixed in my mind and I, now everything is a search for the anchors that will set those things in motion. You follow me? So it isn't, there is nothing random about anything that we do. There's a very specific search because we have a preconceived beauty, sense of the beauty of, that, of the visual impression. Now, I'm not sure there's more I should say, but I'm going to go read David again, see if we just glance through it. So, yeah, so you saw the first part. At some point, you must mix and apply the correct color. Some people learn how to type and others spend their, their entire lives using the hunt and peck method. It's fascinating to look at starts of the masters. Um, actually, one of the things about the hunt and peck versus the, uh, for example, I type with two hands, right? I think of the two-hand method as all the horses at once right? The way I think about all this stuff. So we're all over the place in the start of a painting, an Impressionist painting. And all of these things are searches for, for, for the truth of the relationships and the organization on the rectangle, you know, the composition. But I'm all over the place at once. So I'm doing color. And as soon as I have the colors begins working, I begin to talk about placement, which is the beginning of drawing. And I talk about light effects, which is the beginning of, of the finishing off, you might say, of the, of the color value uh, preliminaries. And you see what I'm doing? Gradually increasing the amount of stuff that has to do with more and more data, right? So form comes in, you know, you know, the movement of roundishness, that sort of stuff. There's all these elements are coming in. So I'm actually truly the, the uh, full-hand typist. I'm not, the, I, in my mind, the hunt and pack guy is somebody gets the drawing first, and then he does a grass eye on it. Then he glues the, the blues in, and then he glues the reds in, or the yellows, or whatever. Do you follow me? That isn't us. That's, that to me is the hunt and peck model. <laughs> I know you don't mean that that way, but 
That's what I think of it as a simplistic model, but ours is the all fingers typing model. And um, so, so that's why that expression, Boston School expression, is you have to be all over the place at once in the start. And, and, and all the horses at once. All right. So they nailed the big impression. I'm, I'm going to go back to this wonderful phrase because you said that so nicely. They nailed the big impression by focusing on the key features with an economy of motion. It's exactly what we do. Yeah. So all these, the whole thing is to get a bunch of color out there. If you're an impression, is to get a bunch of the color values out there and get it starting in motion, and then go and start talking about these anchors, talking about the most significant things you have out there. And you can see in any Boston School work that it's a search for, for the composition, the placement of the phenomena of the visual impression, what we call the ensemble, the location of that thing with their proper effect relationships, their proper color relationships, et cetera. So, um, yeah, but that's so I really like that. That's a really good expression. And I think that's what you mean to be supporting in what I'm saying. So I hope you do, hope it is. Um, so there is a decisive and deliberate strategy in their work. I hope I've just explained to you what decisive and deliberate our, how decisive and deliberate our strategy is. But I hope you can, if you don't know how to do it, I would hope you can sort out the idea of how to search. I know you do it already. Everybody does it. So I, what I'm trying to tell people is don't do side size. Don't say, I got to have this and there it is and it's fixed. I got to have this and there it is and it's fixed. I mean, that's what I'm going to tell you is the problem because the truth is not in those facts, some of which you can't make accurately. So you start living in a, in a, in a compromised world. But the world of the Impressionist, this guy who says, let's see, the darkest dark in life light can only be this. The most chromatic note that I've got out there, I've made the very best I can, it can only be as intense as this, and that's the range I have to live in. No, that's not one of those things where you're talking about, you know, that, that's us, let's put it that way. That's simply us. Um, so decide by not deciding. Um, yeah, the, my idea is, is there are too many decisions being made instead of just watching. And now this is where you can pick on me if you like. <laughs> but instead of just watching, you know where you're going. You have to know what the idea is you're trying to place there. And then you watch to see if you did it. But it's going to take some trial and error to get what you aimed at. First time you put down a note, you're going to have to adjust it. I prefer to get you to put down a note in the canvas, the, the color note, and adjust it until it's as best as you can make it, right? So that's a search for the first note. It's not a mixing and applying the correct color. It's mixing and adjusting the correct color. You see what I mean? So mixing and applying always implies you do it on the palette. I recommend you never do it on the palette except for the first note. Of course, mix, make you do your very best. But when you put it up there and you get into context, especially with two or three things, all of a sudden you'll realize how little you could possibly have known and how much you might have even been affected by white canvas and so on. So, um, um, yeah. But anyway, the, of the masters of our type, yes, the first attempts accomplished color drawing composition and succeeded in very direct expressions, yeah. Um, that really good if you're talking about the expression of the visual impression, the expression of the uh, intensity versus the other intensity, and if you mean everything relational. So, yeah. So I'll stop at that. Um, I'm hoping that just the whole mentality of anchors helps you to clarify that we're not just floating around. I didn't want anybody to get the wrong idea of reading this that um, that David seems to have gotten. I'm not. I'm pretty convinced you don't mean it the way you said uh, that you didn't misunderstand me, but um, but. Trial and error is a big deal. Learning to do it is hugely important. And, um, you know, the idea of staying open, keep your knees bent for the adjustment and all that sort of stuff. I don't know how you can be anything else that way if you actually are respecting the, 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 the idea of the, rep of, of, the, um, of the relational as being the key to all this sort of stuff. But you can put down three notes and have them done wonderful things and put down the fourth note and all of a sudden when you look at the set, it isn't the unity that you were looking for. And at that point, you'd say, this is negotiable. But it doesn't mean you're, not, you're going to say at some point, you say, here's the one I first tried. I see the one I put down first really needs the most adjusting. And now how is my set, right? So if you can stay, keep your knees bent, as I say, you should be okay. But understand, every time you go out there, you're aiming at something very specific. It doesn't, you're aiming small so you can miss small, but you're aiming at something very specific. And by the way, even the note you first put down, it can only be so right, right? What makes it righter is the context. That's the only time you can adjust it is when you get three more notes out there. But you do, obviously, you clearly try to do your very best to what they say, um, uh, put down, oh yeah, apply the correct color. Yeah, you always try to do that. But what you really do is you want to respect what you're seeing happening over here and finding out how proximal it is to the beauty of the impression that you're looking at in nature as you're going along. All right.
Yeah. So if you have a clear sense of where you're heading, all you, there will be, you'll, you'll notice things. You're all hunting for very specific things, and I've named what they will be for you. And everything else is going to be subplot, but the same stuff. So once you've located a very important place left and right, then that'll help you to get the next, like if that's at the halves or something, then it'll help you to the next one to get you the quarters or whatever it is. All those things, one thing leading to another, but the primary ones do want to be real well set, but they want to be well set in relation to each other and uh, set per the composition, you know, and that's the only part that's sort of truly absolute, but there is such a thing as an absolute decision. And if you, and if you change, like for example, I, students all the time around me, I say, give me the top and bottom and don't move, and then I come in the next day and they've changed the top and bottom. That's because they don't, they haven't done, they haven't bought into the idea of making a decision and sticking with the decision. You follow? And that's not the same thing as making a decision and realizing your composition was bad. That's because typically what they're doing is trying to correct a drawing problem and they're trying to correct it and they'll mess up their composition by doing it that way. Well, hopefully you all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, thank you, David, for giving us a, a, a takeoff point for all this stuff. Um, let me look at the videos again. And just one, I mean, the visuals again, just one last thing, you know. One thing I could mention to you, see the, in, the, in the bigger one, the bigger figure here, you can see there are greens in the shoes down here and that hint of greenness here uh, toward the blue side. And you'll see there's a whole set of greens if you're coming back into here. And even to, to whatever degree the wall is green, that is the stuff that you could say, I'm going to mix this note and mix this note and mix this note. You could do it all day long and even be right. But the only way to know you're right is because what they're doing together as a set. So if that set of these notes are doing the right thing as a set, now you're in talking about the truth of the visual impression. So that really is our thing. And it's, it's much the same thing if I said this is the sharpest edge, then before I know what this one is. And by the time you get around to multiple, to multiple edges with, say, with high contrast, you now know for sure, you know things for sure, this one to this one to this one. If you see those as a group, you can say, oh, yeah, those are all right to each other. Uh, well, not you won't say, oh, you all have made them right to each other, right? But that's a, that's a very deliberate action, it's, and you're, you're trying to be decisive about it. So it's not like you're being vague. But in the search, in the search, you're open and you're to, try, to trying something. Keep your eyes open. And you should be open to trying things even in terms of your own methodology so you can get to a better method. As I said, that's happened to me numbers of times in the course. I saw, I've seen people do things, and I said, and guys whose work I didn't even like, but I said, they're doing this the other way around. i got to try that. I wonder what that gets you. Uh, and I was talking about the Fetchin model when he models big masses and then draws the outline into the mass of modeling. You'll see that in a couple of his drawings. And I thought, oh, suppose I draw, blow this thing on as a big egg and then just find the drawing at the edge. That's the Fetchin model. I hadn't been doing that before. So uh, at that point in my training, in my background. Okay, that's probably enough. <laughs> uh, all right, I wish you all a very good week and um, I hope to see you in the next one.